Ever since AMD announced this new GPU, I knew I had to build a small form factor PC around it, and so far, this thing is putting down some really good performance. Hey, what's going on everybody? It's ETA Prime back here again. Today we're going to be putting together a small form factor gaming PC powered by the all new Radeon RX 9070 XT. And this build is a bit unconventional due to the CPU and motherboard I opted to use. But nonetheless, this thing is still going to put down some amazing performance. And of course, we're going with a small form factor setup here. Throughout the build, I'll go over all the parts used. I'll also leave links in the description in case you wanna put something like this together. But the first thing I wanna start out here with is the motherboard, CPU, and cooler. This is an all-in-one setup from Minus Forum. It's the BD795ISE. And basically what we've got here is a 16 core Zen 4 CPU. It's got the cooler built in, and obviously we've got the motherboard. It replaces all of these parts right here. I've got a Ryzen CPU. It's an Intel motherboard mini ITX, but you get the point here, plus a cooler. And to tell you the truth, sometimes you can get out cheaper using one of these all-in-one boards. Right now, the BD795ISE has a $100 coupon off over on Amazon, bringing it down to $399. So you get the CPU, mini ITX motherboard, and a cooler for $400. And the CPU this thing is using is the Ryzen 9 7945HX. Does sound a bit weird because it is a mobile CPU, but we've got 16 cores, 32 threads, and we can do up to 100 watts on this CPU with this board. With this, you're still going to need to add storage, RAM, and a fan for the cooler here. Does come with the mounting bracket. I'm going with the 2TB M.2 SSD from Viper. And when it comes to RAM, this utilizes Sodem DDR5. I've got 32 gigs at 5,600 megahertz. Dual channel, we'll just go ahead and slot it in here. But assembly with this unit is super easy. We've also got two M.2 slots, so you can add more storage if you need to. And we've got that mounting bracket for the fan. There's a ton of different fans that are gonna work with this system here. I just happen to have one of these XPG Vento 120 millimeters laying around, so I figured I'd go ahead and put it on here. Kind of an industrial look, and yeah, it should keep this thing nice and chilly. Once it's all together, looks a little something like this. Really compact mini ITX build here. Now it's time to move over to the case and I'm a huge fan of cheaper small form factor cases that you can pick up on Amazon. I personally never wanna break the bank with the case and this does have a tempered glass side panel, which I was kind of excited to see because a lot of the times you'll see these listed with acrylic and personally, I'm just not a big fan. It's a no-name case, but uh, if you check out Amazon, it's actually called the MATX Case Micro ATX Mini ITX Mini Tower Gaming PC Case with Handle SFF Small Computer Chassis 1.2 Millimeter Thickness Steel Material Fits Micro ATX. And when I originally purchased this a couple weeks ago, there was a 40% off coupon, and that's the big reason I got it. Obviously, this Mini ITX setup is going to fit right inside of this case, and we've got enough room for a full-size GPU. And in order to power everything, I went with the Seasonic Focus 650 watt fully modular power supply. It's an SFX form factor, so I'll have enough room to put my GPU across down on the bottom. But this board doesn't need any kind of special power supply. You can use an ATX, Flex, and obviously SFX is going to work. And the final thing we need to add here is the GPU. Again, we're going with that new AMD Radeon RX 9070 XT. And this is the Sapphire Pulse version. It's using their Tri-X fan system here, and it's a pretty big card. That's why I needed room at the bottom here. Overall, I do think that this is going to work out just fine, especially with the cooling system they implemented here. And even though it's an XT variant, we only need two 8-pin PCIe connectors for this card. So I've got everything installed, I've got everything connected, and the Sapphire card just happens to come with a nice stabilizer bracket, so it's an anti-sag bracket. I do think it actually looks pretty good here. If I was to change one thing with this build right now, it would be the uh, power supply cabling. As you can see, it looks like I've got a ton of cables connected. It only requires those two 8-pin, but this power supply actually came with the dual connectors, and I really wanted to run this off of two 8-pin PCIe connectors directly from the power supply, so I had to use these included cables. Doesn't look bad, but it would be nice if I had two singles to go in there. I also had to add the handle up top, and I have seen a few of these with black handles, but I think the orange does look pretty good. It kind of sets everything off and you don't have to use it, but if you're going to be traveling with this PC, it does come in really handy. For this setup, I'm going to be running Windows 11 Pro. And as you can see, we've got that Ryzen 9 7945HX, 16 cores, 32 threads. 
I've got 32 gigs of DDR5 and the RAM is rated at 56, but it looks like these boards only support up to 5200. But the main claim to fame here is gonna be that Radeon RX 9070 XT. 16 gigs of VRAM, and there is one thing that I'm gonna be doing here. I'm actually just gonna change the power limit on this. So it's pretty simple to do. There's several different applications you could use to do this, but personally, I've already got Afterburner ready to go. I'm gonna take the power limit up to 110%, and this will increase the clocks. Obviously, it's also gonna increase the heat produced by the GPU and wattage, but it's basically free performance that I just don't wanna leave on the table. And just to make sure that applied correctly, I'm gonna run Furmark. I've got the TGP listed up in the top left-hand corner. You can see, yeah, this does go up to close to 340 watts. Now, total board power is rated at around 300 watts. So just taking this up 10%, it will unlock more out of this GPU. I could also undervolt this just a little bit, but I'm gonna leave it right where it is. Next thing I wanna do is take a look at some benchmarks. And the first one we have here is Geekbench 6. You can see single core, 2,882, multi, 16,236. And to tell you the truth, it looks like our multi is a bit down here. There is some tweaking that I can do from the BIOS. Again, we're up to 100 watt TDP on this CPU, but I do think it's got a little more to offer. Moving over to 3D Mark, here's Steel Nomad, and at the top, we've got the system we have now with that Ryzen 9 7945HX. We had a total score of 7,159, and right below it, we've got the Radeon RX 9070 paired up with the 9800X 3D. Not coming too far ahead, but with that 9800X 3D, I had a little more of an overclock on the GPU. But the final one I have here is Time Spy, and this little system actually beat out my Ryzen 7 9800X 3D build I recently did. At the top, we're at 24,168, and you can see with that 9800X 3D on the bottom, 23,613. Pretty impressive here, seeing what this little system can do, but now it's time to move over to some real-world gaming. And the first one we have here is Spider-Man 2, 1440p, very high, ray tracing, completely off. I'm not using any FSR or anything like that, and this was recently updated with FSR 4, which does look really good. With it set up like this, no FSR, no ray tracing, no frame gen, we're seeing over 90 FPS. I mean, this is more than enough. You really don't need more than this but I still wanted to test out FSR4 and frame gen on this card. So upscale method, FSR4, quality, FSR frame gen enabled, and it doubles our frame rate. Now I know there's a lot of people out there that do not like frame generation. Fake frames, I completely understand. And on a card like this, you really don't need it. I personally save frame gen for lower end systems that kind of need a little bit of a boost, but I wanted to show it off here because FSR4 does look good, especially when it's set to quality. Of course, going down to like performance, it starts getting noticeable here. But overall, I mean, we're seeing amazing performance with this game. Next up, we've got Marvel Rivals 1440p Ultra with no FSR. If you want to play this at 4K, it's possible, but you need a little bit of FSR at Ultra or go down to high. Either way, with it set up like this, native 1440p, I saw an average of 118 FPS. Forza Horizon 5, we're at 4K Extreme Plus, and by Extreme Plus, I mean the Extreme preset here is actually not the highest you can go with this game. I'm also not using any FSR, and we're totally maxed out here with this game at 4K, getting over 160 FPS on average. I knew this one wasn't going to have an issue whatsoever, it's just a very well-optimized game. God of War Ragnarok 1440p Ultra, no FSR. We're seeing over 120 FPS during extreme battles, and it will jump up into the 140s when we're just kind of doing some exploring. This game also works great at 4K on the 9070XT. You can get an average of around 78 FPS uh, with no FSR enabled.
Of course, we had to test out Cyberpunk 2077, 1440p, Ultra Preset, not that Ultra Preset, yeah, it does add a little bit of FSR. At 1440, we could actually disable it completely, but I'm really excited about FSR 4 coming over to Cyberpunk 2077. There are some mods like the Optifine mod. I think I'm gonna do a video on that in the next couple days, so keep an eye out. Basically, it'll allow you to add FSR 4 to games that don't support it yet, kind of replacing DLSS with FSR 4. And the final one we had to test was Monster Hunter Wilds. Still kind of a mess with this game. We're at 1440p ultra preset. This does take FSR to quality. Once we turn that off, you will see some dips under 60. We just kind of got to wait this out. We need the developers to optimize this game a bit more. Last thing I wanted to talk about here were CPU and GPU temps. I'm using the stock fan curve on both of these. So for the CPU, it'd be from the BIOS. For the GPU, we could use Afterburner to up it. But for the GPU, we don't need any of that. This is actually staying nice and cool. It's a mobile CPU running it up to 100 watts and average 1440p gaming on the CPU was 79. I could bring this down a bit by upping the uh, fan speed from the BIOS, but it would make it a bit louder. And since it's a mobile CPU, thermal throttle is around 93 degrees Celsius we didn't hit that on the CPU at all. But with the GPU, we were only at an average of around 56 degrees Celsius. Maximum temperature hit throughout all of my tests on the CPU was 86, and for the GPU, 67. Overall, I think the build turned out really nice, and yeah, you could go with a much more expensive case if you wanted to, but I do like going with these cheaper cases, it does keep the cost down. And with that Menace Forum all-in-one motherboard here, that can also keep the cost down on a small form factor build. Again, if I had to change anything, I'd probably go with some different cables for the power supply and I'd add a fan up front. I think we could fit a 120 millimeter, something just kind of slow spinning just to move a little more air inside of the case. But other than that, I do like the performance we're seeing here. Nice form factor. If I could go a bit smaller, I probably would, but you know, given constraints with the GPU size, it's gonna be a bit hard right now. So I think this is kind of the sweet spot right now, given the size of these GPUs. But if you're interested in putting something like this together, I will leave links in the description for everything I used. And if there's anything else you want to see running on this rig, just let me know in the comments below. But that's going to wrap it up for this one. Like always, thanks for watching.